Section 9 of The Sins of Hollywood by Ed Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Movie Queen and a Broken Home. Hollywood drafts its workers from the trenches of life. Argosies from all the seven seas, caravans from every clime, bring their contributions of ambitious toilers to the movie mill. A vivid, living mirage of everything the human heart desires lures alike the innocent blue-eyed girl, the sophisticated damsel, the flower and the froth of mankind into the yawning mouth of the abyss, the tragic realm of moviedom. Showers of gold, luxury realized beyond the wildest dreams, a life resplendent with jewels, gowns that bewilder the eye, ravishing silks and satins, sables and ermine, fortune, fame, and shame. Pugilists become actors, songwriters become directors, physicians become character men, bartenders and buttonhole makers become producers, artist models and modistes mannequins become stars, in some cases almost overnight, and the police court lawyers become arbiters of the public taste. It is a strange world moviedom a strange and a tragic world a wheel on which men and women are piteously broken in body and soul there is something about the pictures which seems to make men and women less human more animal-like there are numerous stories of how men popular idols have abandoned their wives their children to carry on illicit relations with the women of the studios, of how wives have left their husbands to associate with the strange carpenter or the assistant cameraman. These cases are of common knowledge. The winning of another man's wife or another woman's husband was a sort of friendly contest, a game in which many played a hand the incident of the leading woman who took away the husband, a prominent actor and director, of the wife who had discovered her and selected her for the position, is but one example of this kind. At a dance, another leading woman openly boasted that she was going to win a certain assistant director, then present, away from his wife and child. She did. The pair are now in Australia. The wife is working in a Los Angeles office, supporting herself and the girl. They never hear from the husband and father. Only a few months before, this then happy family had enjoyed a wonderful Christmas. A fine big tree, gifts for the girl, games and good food friends dropping in all day whenever the wife passes that house the place of her last happy memories the tears start but the leading woman wanted that man she got him movie conditions close unrestrained contact helped her but a recent case a very recent case involving a certain prominent woman star and a married man, once admired by all who knew him as a model husband, father of two children, is receiving more than passing notice. It has shocked even shockless moviedom. The facts. There came to Hollywood a few years ago a man who had been a famous football player. In the East, he had been known as a great varsity athlete. He is a fine specimen of physical manhood. He is good to look at. His father is a prominent financier, 
rich and liberal. He came to Hollywood with his wife and child. He made friends fast. Everybody liked Hefty, which we will call him hereafter, but which is not his name. He started to serve his time in pictures. He had been a gridiron star. He was naturally affable and a regular fellow. Why not reach stardom on the screen? He worked conscientiously. He was determined to make his way without any fatherly aid. Hefty and his wife took a modest apartment. At night, Hefty came home and helped. Helped with the baby, with the dishes. With the exception of going to an occasional prize fight. His only pleasure was running out to see a few intimate friends they had made. He struggled on. He was good-looking, a type. He had strength and physical appeal. Before long, he was much in demand, had work almost all the time. He was living clean. No scandal attached itself to his name. V, the woman in the case, had reached Hollywood long before. She had already won her way to stardom when Hefty arrived. Aided and abetted by her girlish appearance, her good looks, her insinuating manner, her easy morals, and a capable mother who handled her affairs. She was living in easy opulence on a salary that ran into four figures. She was known to have married at least once although the concern that owned her pictures made much capital of her innocent youth. According to the press notes, she was still in her teens. She had been married to a director. Uh, the flu carried him off. Some time before Hefty appeared on the scene, she had been playing, as they say in Hollywood, a famous aviator, a man who received enormous fees from his daredevil exploits. More than once he had risked his neck after hours spent in V society. For a while, the aviator forgot his wife in Texas to be with V. They had a merry, merry time while it lasted. Then the aviator was killed. At the time Hefty arrived on the scene, V had not yet selected a successor to the aviator. There were what might be called a few casuals who filled in the laps, a wild party or two, but nothing in the way of a prolonged liaison. Where or how they met is of little consequence. Somehow or other they managed to meet in the movies. Their first meetings were but friendly visits. Then V saw to it that Hefty should see more of her. Hefty was willing. Before long, he wanted to be with her often, oftener than he would care to have his wife know. It required cunning with a wife and baby, but somehow they managed it. It is more simple in pictures. There is night work, long trips on location, numerous excuses and opportunities that exist in no other walk of life. In time, Hefty's friends, and he had made a lot of them, began to notice things, to open their eyes. Hefty and V were growing careless, were taking no pains to avoid a scandal. The studios began to talk. Hefty's friends were worried. They felt bad about the thing, for they all liked his wife. She was as good a fellow as her big husband. She was a good wife, a good mother, and a good friend. They were willing to overlook ordinary lapses, 
but this affair was growing dangerous. And besides, his wife was soon again to become a mother. Happy, she had told her intimates of her condition. But Hefty and V didn't seem to be particularly concerned about what their friends had to say or what they thought. Hefty remained away from home more often than not, made few if any excuses, and saw his wife and home only when he could not be with V. Events were fast drawing to a head. The affair was now a matter of common gossip. At last, the wife heard the whole story, learned all the details. Most of them, Hefty himself told her. The telling was cold and brutal. Two or three days before the anticipated arrival of their second child, he came home and informed his wife he was going to leave. He did leave. Entreaty proved unavailing. She pleaded and implored. But Hefty went. The unborn babe had no influence. Then friends abandoned Hefty and came to his wife's aid. They promised to help her. This gave her courage. She was told to threaten. They showed her the only way to reach the victims of movie visitis. She followed their advice. She would expose them, ruin their careers, their money-making powers. This appeal succeeds in Hollywood when the calls of humanity and decency fall flat. So they settled in cash and its equivalents. Hefty made provisions for his family. The wife agreed to keep quiet. But her friends say that she will never be able to quiet the aching heart that will not heal. V is still a star. The alleged movie cleanup has passed her by, and Hefty's friends do not think so much of Hefty, not even in callous Hollywood. End of section nine.